see. Um, and I, she, she is someone who I could say needs no introduction, but I am going to introduce <laughs> Sharon. Because Sharon, Sharon uh, she's come to us from Mansfield, where she lives. Um, so she's come some journey to get here, which I haven't had a chance to catch up with her about. She has extensive work. She's worked extensively in adult education um, for a long period of time. I won't say exactly how long. And that work has been largely located in Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire, and South Yorkshire, uh, <coughs> as, as you'll probably know, formerly known as the People's Republic of South yes. Yorkshire. Is that, is that right? right? Um, she's worked, she worked for many years in the vol. By the way, the reason I can say all this is because I've seen your CV. <laughs> <laughs> so um, she has um, experience of working in the voluntary sector particularly with uh, organisations that advocate on the behalf of, of people with disabilities. Um, she's worked as a community development worker specialising in mental health, <coughs> as a youth worker and also in further education in colleges with a particular focus on women returning to education. Um, in her role as a uh, doctor Clancy, she has published research focused upon the history of adult education, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to have her here today. And more research, recently has been researcher on a European funded policy research in adult learning. She is here, and she, she could be here with many hats on, but she's here today with her hat on as chair of the Raymond Williams Foundation, which I urge you all to join. And she has been closely involved with the 100th Anniversary Committee reporting on adult education. And she, she's also, and I think this is important, she's also um, a community activist, political activist, and I've absolutely no doubt that if, Man if Mansfield defeats Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage in the coming election, it will be in part down to her personal and sustained commitment <laughs> to local activism. <laughs> In her <coughs> time. Yeah. She's also a musician and a singer. Um, I couldn't think of a better person to come from England <coughs> to, a keynote, to be a keynote here. And, I, and, I, and I'm being mean sincerely, I, can't, I cannot adequately convey how, how pleased I am to have, to have her here. Um, she's going to set the scene by painting a picture of us, of the significance of this 100 year anniversary and why it matters and why we feel it's important to reflect on what's at stake at the moment, which is a great deal and how we might build, build for solidarity in the future. So I'm going to hand you over to Sharon. Thank you, I don't know how to follow that. Yeah. <laughs> looking at adult education 100 as we've called ourselves what was the influence of the 100 years the 1919 quarter of 100 years ago what do we need to do for today in taking adult education forwards after the mass destruction of adult education in, in the UK generally and so I'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of foundational thinking in the adult education uh, the original 1919 report and also take us a bit further forward in thinking how that um, reflects on today, I think, in, uh, and how we can perhaps use that for thinking about the future. So the 1919 Adult Education Commission, uh, chaired by the Master of Balliol College, an amazing group of people, trade unionists, adult educators and university academics, uh, they felt that the adult education at the, the particular time they were talking 
post-war, immediately post the First World War, should be about liberal, non-technical adult education. They were very, very committed to trying to pick apart vocational, non-vocational, and they saw that it was essential to all individuals and all communities, and they described it as adult education as a permanent national necessity and inseparable aspect of citizenship and therefore should be both universal and lifelong. And I think that kind of centrally summarises some of the key <coughs> points about adult education. There for life, an aspect of citizenship, and it's part of a permanent national necessity, uh, which as we know has been massively eroded. So the report really brought in a whole swathe of legislation. It enabled local authorities to provide uh, adult education. But I think, critically for me anyway, as a voluntary sector sort of activist and, and community uh, person, that the, they crucially understood the role of the voluntary sector as being as important, if not more important, than local authority education. They saw the resurgence, if you like, or the, the growth of the Workers' Educational Association at the time, the cooperative movement, and they were committed to <coughs> education for transformation at community level much more interested actually in communities than individuals, very interesting compared with our, our focus now perhaps much more on the individual. And they were particularly keen on the idea of how they could enable working class people who had little, little access to education to engage in education for life. And I, I think there's some fascinating parallels with 2019 and 1919. This, this world of risk that we live in at the moment and the world of risk that we saw in, in 1919, the Great War just ended, the whole sway of strikes, rental um, strikes, etc., which was named and described as the war after the war, that extension of the franchise to some women but to all men, immediately post-war, and that kind of international ideological influence, the rise of socialism at the time, the movement of the labour movement, and the break of the established two-party system with the growth of the Labour Party. So this surging growth in adult education infrastructure really reflects something about that ideological change and shift, and the tensions, and in, you know, some of the interesting ideological tensions between the state and the non-state. And now, of course, we have Brexit, you know, the challenges to political legitimacy, <coughs> our contentions around the, the EU and our very much uh, kind of cri a democracy in crisis, I would describe it as. In effectiveness and governance, a lot of people feel that the uh, globalisation has kind of affected um, our ability to govern ourselves as a nation state. The break of the established two-party system. And then, of course, the erosion of the left, which is a terrible tragedy, the rise of nationalism, the rise of right wing populism, which we see everywhere. And most crucially, I think, for today, the destruction of adult and further education, and I'll say a bit more about that, especially for working class communities. So, just skipped. So I see it as in a, as in a real contemporary <coughs> crisis, and I think adult education is absolutely crucial to trying to navigate our way through some of these critical contemporary challenges. So we've got a huge crisis of inequality, social, economic, political inequality in the UK. Huge income disparity. We're now, I think, the most unequal society in the whole of Europe. She's very close to America now as well. And I believe firmly that austerity is a class project and that it disproportionately targets and affects working class communities and households. And in doing so, as Cooper and White described it, protects concentrations of elite wealth and power. And I think this is what we're really committed to trying to challenge. We all also hear this tension, all this, 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 this phrase all the time about left behind communities and the community that I live and um, engage with, if you like, outside work, is described as a, as a, a very typical left behind community form of pit town been absolutely destroyed um, by pit closures in the 90s, but also the loss of the textile industry in the area. Part of the <coughs> former industrial uh, heartland of the UK, particularly the coalfield area, which is where I come from originally too. So we've now got a lot of people in Mansfield, I can speak personally about this, 
who are right behind Leave, right behind Brexit. But if people are very, very quick to judge, and I get this a lot when I speak at things like the world transformed, you know, there's a kind of metropolitan elite sort of perception that people are all either um, very um, racist, thick, you know, there's all kinds of assumptions and perceptions about why people are so angry. And it's 30 years of abuse, basically, that communities destroyed bit by bit. So we're now in a situation where 1.3 million Britons are employed in the gig economy. So I did some work for the Joseph Roundtree Foundation a couple of years ago, looking at um, issues of destitution in Nottingham. And everybody I spoke to was in work. So the crisis is not about work. It's actually about um, the kind of work that we have and the precarity of that work. So we have a situation of completely inadequate shared resources. Not all education is created equal, as we know. So we've got fee-paying schools, access to grammar schools, and we know that grammar schools in England only take, as I said, a tiny proportion of pupils who are or have ever been eligible for free school meals. So that's 2% as opposed to 14% nationally. And I think working class learners have been long, for a very long time perceived as defective or described as defective in numerous ways. I can describe this myself as someone who went from Bolsover to Cambridge, which was a strange transition, <laughs> <laughs> believe me. Um, as a stranger in a foreign land, Sarah Mann's brilliant expression of being in an, an education system that is actually quite alien if you're from a very different cultural background, <coughs> where I used to have people shout things like, hey, look, nil, and things like that. <coughs> so, you know, there is this kind of uh, extraordinary perception um, uh, in our class-riddled culture. So there's growing issues, as we know, of mental health problems, anxiety and depression, and that's across FE, HE. Um, also in the adult residential colleges, where I've done a great deal of research and in schools. And I keep coming back to Raymond Williams' brilliant phrase, culture is ordinary, yeah. you know, that we're all part. That culture belongs to all of us. It's not about elitism. It's not about a particular perception of higher culture. Culture is all of us. Culture is ordinary. So um, that's why I love him so much, Raymond Williams. So I, I, I think a little bit as well, I wanted to <coughs> think a little bit about privilege inequality and the labour aristocracy as well. So I'm proud to say that my father was a minor who went to Ruskin College. <clears throat> and he, I felt, feel that my confidence in, in my own background comes from a sense of being taught and, and, and learning from my father who was radicalised by his experience of going through adult education at the Wilson College. And my grandfather, who was a South Wales minor, who was a left book club member, a socialist. So there is a labour aristocracy, and I use the phrase advisedly, but I think that's been sadly eroded by the destruction of adult education. Even those very colleges themselves now are precarious, in tr tremendous difficulty, many of them. We've seen the destruction of Colic Harlech and other um, adult education colleges just disappearing. <clears throat> so there's always been, I think, a really interesting tension between the state and non-state educational provision. The 1919 report were very committed to the idea that the LEAs were not necessarily the right people to provide the kinds of adult education that would connect with communities. They said that we do not think that local authorities will, generally speaking, take bold steps for the provision of non-vocational subjects. And they also said non-vocational adult education has not in the past thriven in it in the, in the state sector. They were concerned that local authorities were far more focused on children's education, as they should have been, understandably, and that the state would only act as a medium for encouraging and assisting the activities of universities and local educational authorities and the educational work of voluntary bodies it should do that and we regard this as the main function of the state so far as education is concerned so they always saw it as an aid not necessarily as the means of actually creating the educational system so they saw always a strong role for the non-state and I think this is absolutely fascinating. So you look, I, I had the pleasure of going to the National Archives over the summer and looking at some of the correspondence connected to the adult education to the 1919 report. 
And the fear and anxiety, which I think is there, I think adult education is essentially profoundly political. Um, and I think they're afraid of us in lots of ways, those of us who've been through that kind of system. And, th and this is writ large by some of the testimony at the time, some of the um, comments at the time, about um, a real tension and lack of trust, if you like. So I'll just read this quote out. There is still a number of education committees who are unable to understand a desire for education of no direct utilitarian value unless it be for purposes of personal accomplishment, and who suspect dark motives in the minds of those who desire such education. More especially is this so where the demand is for the study of problems which are controversial. It is within our knowledge that there are even today town councillors to whom the term economics is synonymous with socialism. The majority of those who desire to study do so probably because of the interest they have already taken in industrial or other public affairs that free area of conscientisation, trade unionists. This is probably the basis for the charge sometimes made by local authorities and even by some members of universities that the classes encourage discontent and socialism. And, I love this bit, one tutor was reputedly told upon requesting a room for meetings for educational purposes, if we let you have a room, you will make the place a den of anarchists. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's a fantastic sort of testimony, and he's there throughout all the correspondence, through all the letters. Uh, it's fascinating, it's a, a real fascinating glimpse into the history, and I sense that still, very definitely. You know, that kind of that sense of people learning their political, social, economic context and understanding um, their, their, their position in the world and being able to contest and challenge it, really important. And I, I often come back to Stuart Hall's prescient 1958 quote, um, and, it, and I believe this is absolutely centrally true. He said, class and education basically have been at the center of political and intellectual struggles throughout the last century. And he, this is a quote from 1958. Surely there has never been a greater cleavage between the tone of our society, its manner and forms, and the gross realities. What happens to a society rigidly class bound, which was, uses continually the language of equality? What happens to an oligarchy which conceals itself behind the rhetoric of the popular democracy? What happens when larger numbers are trained each year for responsibility and participation, but where the sources of power and decision grow every day more remote? All our energies are expanded, expended sorry, in creating and consuming a culture whose sole purpose is to cover up the realities of our social life. I think that's incredibly prescient in 1958, and so continues to be absolutely true. So the reason I like Raymond Williams so much is, of course, he was a university professor in Cambridge, um, but he spent many, many years working as an adult educationist with WEA, and he believed categorically that education is about being part of the social change not just observing, but being fundamentally part of the social change. It's not about remedying deficit or making up for inadequate educational resources, nor is it about just meeting the needs of a new society. And I had lots of arguments as part of the commission about this. So it's not just about responding to the fact that AI is there and we need to be more responsive to kind of challenges of the digital world and so on and so forth, but it is about changing fundamentally, being part of the change he said it were not the, the bottle with the message in it, bobbing on the tides and waves of history, but instead we have to be about being part of the process of social change itself, and that the learning is fundamental to that. And I, I do think that's a really important point, the social realities that we're actually facing, the rhetoric versus the reality. I'm a great fan of Diane Ray's speak, uh, writings, and I saw her speak at the World Transform recently. She says social mobility, which we're told is the kind of way out. And I, my father would have always disagreed with this because he went back straight back to the community he came from. Newly empowered, newly knowledgeable. She said it's a red herring, given the current high levels of inequality. <coughs> social mobility is primarily about recycling the inequality rather than tackling it. I think that's correct. <laughs> I also think that this focus on widening participation for those of us who've worked in this world, which I have as well within the university sector, um, you know, wider participation, we, we are infatuated with a particular group of people, 
um, in terms of wider participation, specifically 18-year-olds <coughs> from underrepresented groups, and even that's a moot point, into selective universities. But the total number of learners in further education and skills has fallen 26.5% over five years. And the decline in the numbers of mature part-time and full-time learners is catastrophic. I and mean, we're looking at a fall of almost 60% overall. Um, so this is, this is you know, a major challenge that we're facing. So much of the um, current emphasis tends to be on young adults, which is also correct. But the group's really complex. The group of people who want to take on adult education in FE and beyond. So we've got 1.9 million adults who study or train in colleges. Students over, 90, over 19 in further education generate an, an additional 70 billion for the economy over their lifetimes. So this is not insubstantial. 30% of adults in colleges are from an ethnic minority background. So there's an incredibly important diversity element um, in, in terms of the learners in FE. 200,000 <coughs> adult apprentices and 106,000 college students are aged 60 and over. So there's also that incredibly important age profile. And I think informal learning is the heart of it, a lot of, to, at the heart of a lot of this, as I've indicated, I think, you know. And Williams was always concerned that that voluntary sector role, that community sector role, was about escaping the elite-controlled schoolhouse and university. It came through family, through church, through community centres, through libraries, museums, reading groups. It was about debate, discussion and collectivism. You see important examples of people becoming aware of what's going on around them in the army, for instance, the wonderful Cairo Parliament, if people have come across that in, during the war, when people were given a copy of, uh, of the Beveridge Report. And this was fundamental to the development of the Labour Party and its huge landslide victory mm -hmm. after the war as well, in that people were becoming aware of their circumstances, social, political, economic. And I think that's what I was referring to with the Labour aristocracy, that knowledge and understanding that you can challenge. The importance of the evening classes in the NUN, and I, I mentioned that my father went through that route. So he was actually supported by the NUN to go to evening classes first and then ultimately to, to Ruskin. So the important role that we still have around adult residential colleges, few in number now, in fact, we, we had four, but now, of course, Hillcroft, which was the only women's college, has merged with Richmond College, so we've got a bit of a problem there, even defining that entirely as, a, as, a, as an adult residential college purely for women any longer. And the important role of community education, but also its mass destruction mm. as a result of austerity. We've talked to lots of colleagues um, who've, who were absolutely on their uppers financially in that world. So we have a massive issue here <coughs> around rebuilding anything. And I, I think particularly, that learning as an adult, particularly for those from the working class communities, people need to feel that they can actively participate in the construction of the knowledge, that they are not just passive recipients of knowledge. I think universities often do this very badly, don't recognise the importance of community-based knowledge, tacit knowledge and understanding at the community level. Too often, um, they think about knowledge transfer rather than knowledge exchange, and, I, and I've said this with the last seven or eight years, but not always, um, you know, not always heard. So I think education has to value and respect different cultural worlds and backgrounds, and ethnically diverse communities and learners. And culture is ordinary, coming back to the Ray Williams phrase. Adult learning has to be, I think, through collaborative sharing, small group work, and interviewing other people on the street or in the neighbourhood, feeling engaged in the learning process. And I think that's the crucial, critical thing that adult education did so well and has done well. It's been based fundamentally on a pedagogical approach that is about small group discussion and debate. I don't have a problem with online learning, incidentally, at all. But I do think that face-to-face -face connection where you talk to people, you hear other perspectives and other issues is crucial. And that's what adult education fundamentally did at its best. So adult working class learners need to measure what goes on in the curriculum against their own experience and their own life stories. And I think without the chance of connecting to that lifetime of experiences, you know, if you've got a formal uh, curriculum that doesn't, doesn't recognise that, I, can, I think adult learners find it difficult to connect and engage with the learning experience. So, <clears throat> 
I just think, just to finish really, to reflect a little bit on those kind of final resources for a journey of hope, which is one of, again, one of Raymond Williams's important uh, expressions. So we're at an incredibly important time, I think, at the moment. Obviously, we're in the run-up to an election as well, so everything to blame for. But I think political education, for me, is about criticality. It's about critical thinking. It's about consciousness. It's about being aware of your place in the world. So much at the moment distorts, as Stuart Hall described that, the kind of hall, you know, that, you know, the mirrors that surround us, the smoke and mirrors. So we don't always see what we're actually living. And I've been involved for the last three years in the world transform, really talking about adult education. And I was kind of surprised that their learning platforms um, initially didn't have any mention of adult education at all. And I'm sure I wasn't the only voice asking for a, adult education to be taken seriously, but I haven't really pushed for it. And there is a growing sense now that the World Transform itself as, a, as an organisation, not just a fringe movement, um, is taking that very seriously. So um, there are two new research fellows working for the World Transform who are now looking at what political education is taking place across um, the UK. And they're trying to develop a network and also a nexus of kind of people who have got the skills and abilities and interest to, to promote some of the political education work. So in my other life, outside work, I'm a political education officer for Mansfield Labour Party. And I've been struck by people's passion and enthusiasm for getting together and having a debate or discussion. We've had two debates on Brexit, which was quite, quite scary, I have to say, but really powerful. Really powerful and, and not at all a bunch of people being, as I said earlier, you know, being kind of um, um, small-minded and bigoted. And not at all, actually. It was much more nuanced than that. Um, okay, you could say you're preaching to the converted to an extent, a group of Labour Party members. They're kind of perhaps more open. But there was a, a genuine sense of people sharing all kinds of difference of opinion. And, and I also led a session at the World Transformed in September about... Brexit, but it wasn't about Brexit, the content or the detail, it was about what it's done to our ability to talk to one another, to communicate. So we've got increasing this shouting factor where people stand on opposite sides of, of the divide and just yell at one another. You know, and this was really more about critical discourse and ability to, to talk to one another. So, um, so I'm passionate about the, the world transform. I can see it itself transforming. So the first time I went, perhaps three years ago, I did feel this sense of a, a strong sense of a metropolitan elite, very London-centric. It was held in Brighton as well. Uh, the following year it was in Liverpool, and already feeling a sense that there was a kind of growing movement of people from areas like the one in which I live, um, starting to, to really you know, argue the case for a, a more nuanced understanding of left-behind communities. Um, so, a few of us are trying to do that. The Raymond Williams Foundation has been fundamental in my knowledge and understanding. I've learned so much from the people there, I can't tell you. Often, older people who've been involved with the socialist movement in one way or another, the left movement, for a long, long time. And they've been my education in many ways. But they are great advocates for informal learning, exactly as Raymond Williams said. The community-based education that we have a culture is ordinary approach, if you like, each day, every day, it's part of everyday life. So they promote informal learning structures. So we have um, discussions in pubs, not everything's in pubs, by the way, but these two are, um, and uh, philosophy in pubs. And then, but they're committed to the idea of informal learning structures generally. They do have many debates and discussions across <coughs> different parts of the UK. And then, of course, Adult Education 100, coming back to this idea of life-wide education. So the commission, the Centenary Commission that I've been part of in that capacity as, as, as chair of the Ray Williams Foundation, has spent a year looking at different aspects of adult education. Our recommendations and final report come out on Monday. So it's, it's kind of embargoed till then, and um, we're just about to sort of send out some press releases. But there are 17 recommendations in the final Adult Education 100 report, the Centrinian Commission report. 
And it's been a fantastic experience working with the WEA, working with unit, across a number of universities. I've been part of the steering group that's been doing all the work behind it, um, along with uh, my uh, colleague, uh, John Holford, Professor John Holford at the University of Nottingham. So um, it's been incredibly powerful working with the Cooperative College, with Silla Ross and other colleagues. And what we've discovered, I think, is that it's very easy to ignore informal community-based education. So we, Silla and I, and Dr. Nick Mahoney from the Raymond Williams Foundation also, have spent quite a lot of time going out interviewing at community level. We felt that was really important, absolutely crucial to get that voice in there and to not focus exclusively on state and formal education, adult education. So we spent a lot of time uh, working in that area. And finally, the last couple really, uh, I think there's, a, there's an opportunity here. We've got this great surge in social movements around us, you know, particularly around climate change, extinction rebellion, and other groups, um, and inequality. And I think this is a prime moment where we, we need to come together and challenge the status quo. Um, I've just been doing some work as well for the Society for Educational Studies, looking at um, the 1918 Education Act and relating that to the 1919 report, and actually looking at some of these tensions around the state and the non-state non provision of education, really important. So a crucial time, I think an absolutely crucial time. And I can just say just a few words about the report when it comes out on Monday. I hope people will rush out and go and read it. Um, but obviously it's, it's, it's crucial that we have a partnership approach to this. So one of the thing, one of the key recommendations is going to be around having locally based um, educational partnerships. So which look at education cradle to grave, not just as um, particularly of the way we have it at the moment is very kind of atomised and truncated and chunked up into different segments in life. So this is about the seamless understanding of education. And I'm pleased to say that Labour Party recently, of course, has talked about this six-year opportunity for people to continue to learn into adulthood. Um, and they're also, obviously, their national education strategies fundamentally now start to include um, elements around adult education, which I'm enormously grateful for. We also are asking that there has, to, we're also suggesting strongly that there has to be a, a strategy at national level for adult education, which is part of, um, uh, you know, these locally based partnerships, so the strategy is, is taken to the community and is enacted at community level. And that there's a strong focus around community and informal learning within that. We're also saying that FE colleges have become, in many instances, disconnected from the communities they serve. I can say that certainly um, some, from some of the research I've done at, uh, in Mansfield and that that's partly about their governance structures. So we are saying very strongly that FE colleges need to have locally based people as part of their trustee and governance, governance, governance structures, um, and because that's about local ownership. And crucially, we're asking for financial support for this infrastructure. So I don't know how it's gonna go. We don't know what kind of reaction we're gonna get, but it has been a fascinating experience being part of the commission which has been a, a real mixture of people as well, it would be fair to say. So captains of industry, myself, Scylla, um, you know, a, a kind of real mixture of people, uh, Melissa Ben, the journalist, and so on. It's been a, a fascinating journey for the last year. The culmination of our work was on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you very much, really. Uh,
put up on one of the pieces of paper <coughs> around there, and that can continue <coughs> on back to our chat or uh, writings um, during lunchtime, and also our discussions in lunchtime. <coughs> and I think that would be fantastic. And also feed into the legacy <coughs> of this day, which we hope will go back in the minutes. So, um, any questions to Sharon in the <coughs> minutes? Yeah, I've got one. Right, okay, we've got one now, okay, yes. Um, you spoke about the, the makeup of the commission. Yes. You've just been involved in, and you mentioned some quite high profile names within that. Were there adult learners represented within that commission? Were they part of that? No. And this is one of the did things I felt. Did everybody, sorry, did everybody hear that? Okay. So, um, it's just were, were <laughs> adult learners involved in the commission? Yeah. yeah, they weren't. And I thought that was an omission. Which is what one of the reasons why myself, Silla, and Nick Mahoney, as I mentioned, did a whole series of interviews throughout the summer because we felt that learner voice was incredibly important. And also, adult education practitioners on the ground felt we weren't sufficient of them. It's a real tension, to be honest. It's interesting because yeah. it's critiqued in the Moser report that there were no adult yeah. learners involved yeah. in that and the makeup of that report yeah. at that time yeah. was heavily criticised. Yeah. So it's quite interesting that Absolutely. that has potentially been repeated. I felt that from the start. But we were, I suppose our way of dealing with it was to, A, we had a number of workshops. So we had, each time the commission met, we, we did have learner voices in that sense, in that we'd have a series of workshops connected with the commission meetings, mm -hmm. so in Oxford, in Manchester, and, and in London. Mm -hmm. So we, we tried, but it was, it, they weren't part of the commission, which I would have liked to have seen. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Before I go to John, is there anybody else with a question right now? That's Olivia as well. Okay, so John, I don't actually know what <coughs> you're in the room, but... <laughs> <laughs> it, just, it looks like you do. <laughs> I'm wondering if your research was done just in England or if you included the other countries within the UK. Yes, we did. So the Commission, um, we did quite a lot of research in Wales and we also did some work in Scotland as well. Though I wasn't personally involved with that just because I've got too much to do basically <laughs> in England. You know. But yeah, we have. We've, we've got chapters on, the, on Wales and Scotland in the Commission report. Yeah. Actually, before we go to, to John, what did, have you got a sense of how the 1919 reflected the, the Welsh, English and Scottish context and if, if any comparisons mm. to make there? I think the Scottish, there is a Scottish, again in the original 1919 report, there is a Scottish chapter. Yes. Um, I can't remember whether there's a Welsh one, to be honest, I should know. I think there is, yeah. Okay. Um, so they did try, but whether they did it as successfully or as robustly, I don't really know, is, is the honest answer. I don't, perhaps other people know more than I do. We'll, we'll, we'll come yeah. back to yeah. that in later. Yeah. Yeah. That's good, thank yeah. you. And John? Shannon, I really enjoyed your input. I really, I love reading movies. I love all that culture it's on me. I love the idea of a day of anarchists. I do. <laughs> and uh, you're both more, most welcome here. Don't they, don't, as political education officer of the Labour Party in Mansfield, you know, uh, you're looking at Brexit. You're looking at uh, perhaps another referendum. You're looking at a potential in England. Uh, Corbyn government, yeah. are you critically looking at Scotland and the difficulties that we're faced with having a Labour Party leader coming up here and telling us we can't have another referendum, another MD2? Yeah. So it's just, yeah. it, I, I think if we're looking at criticality, mm -hmm. if we're looking at a den of anarchists, you know, uh, we need some answers about that. We need, we need you and the Labour Party momentum to look uh, at Scotland from a different gauge. Uh, the same yeah. way you look at the uh, island of Palestine, I think. No, I don't well, totally I'm aware that, that that's, that's a question to Sharon with, 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 mm -hmm. it, like, as a political question mm -hmm. rather than an educational question. <laughs> However, I'm happy to get into that just now. I am not an expert on Scotland, I've got to, you know, probably because I don't, I don't live here, but, but I, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I, I would think of it perhaps more, I, I felt, you know, I've got more connections with Wales directly, personally. So, I, but I, I see the same issue there and that they have particular circumstances. They're not in the situation of, you know, the referendum situation, but there is a, 
an entirely different culture, different kind of educational system as well. Yeah. And so I do think we need to be looking at much more reflexively at this kind of issue, yeah. I mean, I, and I think the Labour Party um, needs to be more open to that kind of criticality full stop, basically. I've been saying that in the context of the world transformed, which I saw as being, as I said, very London metropolitan, quite an elitist kind of structure, quite middle class, really misrepresenting my own background and culture, for example. So uh, that criticality needs to extend, yeah. <coughs> and, I, and that's probably as much as I can say, personally. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Anybody else at the moment? Right. Dorothy, what's... Oh, oh sorry. Oh, I was, sorry. Sorry, I was just going to say that um, this is really interesting. I didn't know, because I don't have a background in education, mm -hmm. per se, whether this was relevant to me. I loved everything. It makes such sense in my world as well. But Scotland is quite different. So Scotland, the Scottish government have given us a, a policy called rights, respect and, respond, um, rights, respect and recovery. Mm -hmm. And it very clearly states in that that lived experience is at the heart of everything we do. But yes. also, when you're talking about these social movements, these are, there's huge global movements out there happening all over. So is there any ULAMers here? Anyone? No, ULAMers, ULAM. Yeah. yeah, if you heard of it, right? So it's a free yeah. online, it's a global transformation, but really what I'm thinking, because it's a centenary, they're looking for um, this, the Fire Starter Festival started for all that, that educational stuff, and it would be a fantastic opportunity to have this, your report, put out on that platform mm -hmm. for lots of people like me, that has synergy to what you are all talking yeah, about, yeah. but not absolutely in it, yeah. but can see the relevance of why we all need to get <coughs> together. Oh, so that's, I think that's a really good point. And one of the things I forgot to say um, was that one of the things that we're doing within the Raymond Williams Foundation, we don't just want to stop with the, all the interviews and, um, that, and discussions that we had over the summer that I mentioned yeah. at community level, but with newer with, with user-led organisations and people, uh, the kind of local movements as well, because there are many of them, um, and, uh, and regional movements, not just the big globals that I mentioned. Um, we want to continue that conversation on. So that would be a perfect opportunity. And the Raymond Williams Foundation have, have, have committed to put in some of our limited resources, basically, into continuing those discussions. And I'd love to do it in Wales and Scotland too. So if there's connections you have and yeah, links absolutely. you can offer me, I'd be immensely grateful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I will do because I just think it's so useful actually for everybody. And yeah. the, the course that they do, they do a, sort of a one hour, it's a free online just to give you a flavour yeah. of what this looks like. But it is all about transformational change. Completely. It is all about things. The mess of, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, it, and it's a global movement everywhere. So yeah. it's, it's dead exciting. Yeah, well, and Raymond Williams, of course, was Welsh. I forgot to say say that in the first place. <laughs> so, so, so we've got connection with Wales already. Yeah, yeah. But so it would be great to explore that yeah, yeah. in Scotland. Please, could, yeah. is that something you could put up on, on one of the sheets of paper? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and then everybody can see mm -hmm. that. So yeah, yeah, that's everybody should at least point. explore that. It's, yeah. it's just, it just blows your mind once you start to see what what input this could have yeah. for other people's learning globally. It's just really yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to go to the back and then I'm going to go to Gordy for a wee update, so yes. Uh, my name is Terry Brotherstone, I'm on the board of New Battle Library College, so I just wanted to make sure that in this important conference, and thank you very much for the contribution that the, that, that name is in at the beginning, because uh, the history of New Battle Abbey um, yeah. very much reflects some of the things that you were saying from the Den of Anarchists question through to how we control the outcome of Red Clyde's side and make sure the workers don't get ideas about their station and so forth. Uh, I, I'll leave some material with a couple of very good articles on the history of, of New Battle. And of course, it has survived since the closures, the attempted closures, and successful in some cases since the uh, early 1990s, by partly now becoming, in a sense, part of the educational establishment in Scotland, successfully in as much as it's the hub for adult education and we're trying to promote it in other ways, including opening a, 
major academic conference on the uh, septentrion of the uh, Declaration of Arms next year. So it, it's, it's focused on that. But of course, that doesn't resolve the, the issues that you're talking about, which is uh, linked, well, I mean, it has good links with the community in a sense. But what sort of education is being provided? Yeah. It's no longer simply a, a, a residential adult education college. Um, its survival is an absolutely incredible success story, actually, uh, involving enormous work by <laughs> quite small numbers of people. Mm. But <coughs> at the very least, as far as this conference is concerned, its actual history, its actual existence, uh, it, it, it creates a focus for discussing all these questions, including critically, uh, yeah. uh, all, all these questions that you're raising. Yeah. And it's extraordinary in Scotland how little is known about it and how actually the trade unions um, who have been trying to involve with it again much more uh, don't really pay that much attention to it. No, so I think, um, I think um, it's an important thing to make sure that it's on the agenda of this conference. I'm really glad you mentioned that. So my research, my PhD is on adult residential colleges. It was a specific one, basically, based down in Shropshire. Um, but I took a more broader lens, so New Batamabi was one of the ones that I looked at, as well as Colleague Harley. Um, and, and, and it is that tension that you describe continually on every single level. Wedge Memorial College, which Derek Tapney used to be the chair of the Ray Williams Foundation, led for so many years. Um, that tension between political education, politicisation, people becoming critically aware of their social economic circumstances and so on, and a kind of more liberal arts-based education, uh, which seemed to be more palatable to the establishment, <laughs> and that ongoing tension. I love critical art, about the arts and you know, emancipatory arts myself personally, but that has <coughs> always been that kind of twin track within the residential colleges, I think. And it's interesting that fur crop, which is thriving still, just um, a trade, Ruskin certainly has severed many of its ties with the trade union movement, and um, you know, many people have now left and set up independent co-ops, as some of you will know, as a result. Um, but also places like fur are dealing more and more on a therapeutic basis with perhaps the most vulnerable and disadvantaged people in society. So it's interesting how they've moved away from political and labour-based education. Yeah. I'm going to turn quickly to Gordy. Do you have any updates at the minute, or is it a general announcement about logging in? Uh, to, just to very uh, briefly, one, Sharon, can you please have a copy of the slides of your inspiring mm -hmm. presentation? Yes, yes. yes. And the other theme that's coming out is the worry that um, policy is limited as to who it's aimed at within adult education. Um, <laughs> how do we make six, sure that six years of free adult education for all is not get sucked by the any highly educated? How do we come to a lifelong learning opportunity for the many, not just the few? And that there seems to be a focus on adult education for young people and a requirement to change ideas as regards what a student is and it's not defined by one's age. Yes, totally. <coughs> and um, I know I think I totally agree about the comments as well about how you think, sort of engage with policy makers and get them to stop thinking about it as just a kind of a cut off point at 1920 or thereabouts, you know. So I was saying, Ray Williams Foundation um, fundamentally argues for lifelong education. Um, and then you get bodies like the um, University of the Third Age, for example. But they, I mean, I, I, I don't know them intimately. <laughs> I've met a few people from the U3A sort of sector and they're quite community orientated. But I, I, I do work with a community development worker, stroke gerontologist, who says to me that the danger is that too often education for older adults is seen as a form of therapy and sort of well-being. It's not about emancipation and education and or learning. And so, and I would say that if we do have that ongoing six-year um, education it needs to continue and it needs to continue for life. We need to be promoting that message really strongly, I think. So, um, yeah, I'm committed to that anyway. I'm sure for that message, yeah. Sharon, well, you, you, I'm, I'm very pleased because you've already identified that, that you're going to come back. <laughs> 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 I've just got one.
particularly through your, your, the work that you've done, researching new battle, which is really, well, I've decided is very important. <laughs> 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 so I'm, I'm very much hoping that at some point that comes out of this, that you, that, that you, you gain some knowledge. Yeah. You, get, you can continue your dialogue with Scotland mm -hmm. as you have with Wales, and I hope that you would all agree with that. Yeah.